It's my honor to introduce our keynote speaker at, at lunch, the Honorable Jeffrey Sutton. As I'm sure all of you know, he's been a judge on the Sixth Circuit since 2003. Before that, he was the Solicitor General of Ohio, and be still before that, he clerked on the Supreme Court. He is also, most importantly for present purposes, the author of 51 Imperfect Solutions, States in the Making of American Constitutional Law. The judge has been so kind to come here today and speak to us about his thesis. And when he's done, he's going to open the floor to questions. So I introduce to you Judge Sutton. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Matt. Um, nothing inspires confidence in a speaker quite like a stopwatch. Uh, so I'm going to set mine and, and speak about 20 minutes and really hope to engage you on some of the uh, things I'm gonna talk about today. I'm really honored to be here. I'm honored to be in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania. Uh, my family's roots are actually from uh, Pennsylvania. My father went to Westtown, the prep school nearby, and my mom's from Warren, Pennsylvania, which is where Justice Jackson's from in the northwestern part of the state. Um, so I'm leaving church a couple months ago, and a retired doctor friend of mine sees me as we're leaving, and he says, Jeff, Jeff, I hear you've written a book. That's so exciting. Uh, is there an autobiography? I said, nah, not exactly. Um, well, is it a mystery? That would be really fun. And I said, no, it's not a mystery. Well, Jeff, what's it about? And then with a lot of enthusiasm, a big smile on my face, state constitutions. Uh, Long, awkward pause, and, and, and finally Dr. Briggs says, you sure it's not a mystery? Um, well, the reality is there is a little bit of autobiography and a little bit of mystery in all of this, and uh, maybe I'll start with the autobiography part of it. Why, why am I writing about state constitutions, and why do I care so much about it? Um, well, number one, uh, there's a pretty misleading story out there when it comes to the topic of American constitutional law, which is how we should think about it, and I hope the way you'll think about it after today. Um, if we were to go to Penn's Law School, Villanova's, and pull all the con law books together, con law, you would see that essentially all of them tell just half of the story. Uh, they're all about the US Supreme Court and the US Constitution, they rarely mention if they mention at all our state constitutions and our state courts. Let me just stop right there, since we've had several wonderful state court judges and justices talk today, to just make sure everyone realizes the difference in workload and the, really the significance of the state courts vis-a-vis -vis my court, the federal courts. Uh, the last year for which there were statistics for the full year, I think it's 2016, there were 84 million cases filed in state court. That same year, it was a little over 320,000 cases in the whole federal court system. That is an apples to apples comparison because the federal district courts, of course, cover the entire geography of the United States. And of course, the state courts, the 50 state courts, or 51, 52, whatever it was we got to, uh, cover that same area. Half of those cases, half of those cases are probably criminal law cases. And I can just about guarantee every work day of the week, people are missing an opportunity to talk about state constitutions in those cases. So one problem out there from my perspective, it's a law school problem, it's, it's the treatise problem, is we just for some reason or another just want to tell half the story about this big topic of American constitutional law, which in full covers state and federal constitutions, all 51 constitutions. There's another part of the narrative that's quite inaccurate, but perhaps explains our obsession with the US Supreme Court and US constitutional law. And that's that the narrative is always essentially the same. In fact, you don't need to know much more than this narrative to, than to pass, to pass the bar exam on the federal con law questions one is apt to get. And that's that the bad guys, the villains, the goats in the story are some state entity, a state legislature, a state court, a state governor. And the heroes, the cavalry, is always the US Supreme Court coming in to save the day. Now, quite sadly, in American history, there are several chapters, um, several unfortunate chapters in American history that support that narrative. Uh, Jim Crow leading to Brown versus Board of Education being the very best example. 
But I thought it appropriate in the book, and it's, it's really one of the points of the four chapters in the book, to supplement that story uh, with a couple accounts where the US Supreme Court was the villain. Uh, that would be Buck versus Bell. Most of you know about Buck versus Bell, Justice Holmes' infamous line, three generations of imbeciles are enough. Now, the part of that story I'm quite confident you don't know, but is featured in the book, is that before the 1927 Buck versus Bell decision, there were eight lower court cases, six in the state courts, two in the federal courts, seven of the eight get it right by the verdict of history. The very best state court decisions rely in part on their state constitutions in granting relief. So there's a story where the US Supreme Court clearly got it wrong. The state courts to a court got it right, but it's a story no one knows. Um, if there's, you know, if there's one message about American government, from my perspective, is that if you rely too heavily on any one branch of government, state or federal, courts or legislature, executive branch or not, you're eventually going to be sorely disappointed. So one reason I'm on this mission is I'm so eager to get us to start thinking a little bit more seriously about state courts and the role state constitutions play in protecting individual rights. That leads to the second, I'll say, autobiographical explanation for why I wrote the book and why I've been speaking about it so much. Of course, I'm a federal judge. Um, this is not my area. Um, in fact, in, I'm in my 16th year. Um, in that period of time, I've just had one state constitutional case. Uh, quite sadly, it was a case from Michigan where the Michigan Supreme Court did lockstepped with the US Constitution, meaning they didn't diverge from the US Constitution. Very disappointing to me. I thought my ship had come in. I, I, when I do get a state con law case, it's going to be a very long opinion. And I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to it. I've got this 216-page book as a head start. Um, the reality is most challenges to state and local laws under state constitutions eventually end up in state court. And uh, of course, the state Supreme Court justices are the final decision makers about state constitutions. So that makes some sense. But that should lead to some cognitive dissonance. Why does a federal judge care so much about it that he would speak all over the country, write a book about it, write a bunch of articles about it? And that relates to my experience as a court of appeals judge the last 15 plus years and my experience as an advocate at the US Supreme Court. What I've watched during my legal career is basically an escalating rights problem at the US Supreme Court. Um, it seems you know you get a blue right, the US Supreme Court, a red right, a blue right, and escalating rights. Um, this is a very rational thing to see happen. It's very rational for Americans to want these winner-take-all fights at the US Supreme Court. I mean, what can be better than having the US Supreme Court nationalize your perspective on an issue under the US Constitution and in doing so, sideline your opponents. And it really doesn't get much better than that. It's really the same dynamic as nationalizing things, kind of one-stop shopping at Congress, but it just happens to be even better. Because if you win at Congress, you know, if the political winds change, it can be undone. Very hard to undo things at the US Supreme Court. So what's been happening during my legal career is very rational, it's very sensible, and it very much has this, if you can't beat them, join them. You get your rights, we get ours. As the shifting winds at the court go, the only consistent theme is more escalation, more rights, more nationalization of our property and liberty rights. Now, you might say, why would a federal judge be troubled by that? Everything I've just described is another way of saying the power being exercised by the federal courts continues to grow and has continued to grow each decade. I should like that as a federal judge. Uh, more power, I get invited to more cocktail parties. I seem more important, more impressive than of course I really am. So in many ways, it's in my self-interest for the US Supreme Court to have this much power, to exercise still more of it, and perhaps as a seasoned junior varsity federal court of appeals judge, maybe even have some influence on which rights are recognized and which not. There's just one small problem with this escalating rights phenomenon we're watching. It's getting harder and harder for the American people to settle on who those justices should be.
really, unless you're hiding under a rock the last several years, you've watched some pretty intense fights about who ought to be on the U.S. Supreme Court, and they go back to, you know, post-law school for me. Justice Thomas, my year clerking at the U.S. Supreme Court was the year Justice Thomas was confirmed. My first year of law school was the Bork hearing. So I've been watching this for a while. Um, I don't think it's going to slow down. I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. In fact, one could make the argument that the last presidential election turned on people voting for the president as a proxy for filling one slot on a nine-member court. That is an astonishing observation about American politics and American government. Again, I can defend it. It's perfectly reasonable. Indeed, it's quite rational. The American people might be fools in the short, time, short term, but they are not fools in the long term. They know how much power this court's exercising, and they want to say and who the people on that court are and what their judicial philosophies happen to be. So since I'm quite afraid that the trajectory we're on with the US Supreme Court is going to end in tears, I want to find a way off of this path. There's really a couple possibilities. One possibility is both sides, you kind of have a detente where there's less rights recognition. Another possibility is there's not a detente, but there's less right rec rights recognition by the majority that's on the court there. The key thing that's very hard for us in this country is that I don't think there has been a country in American history, uh, excuse me, I don't think there's been a country in world history, whether present or in the past, that believed more fervently in judicially enforceable rights. It's really, I think, all part of the legacy of Brown. It's something we embrace. It's something we're proud of. And it seems to me it's very difficult to turn that ocean liner around. Personally, if I had my druthers, I would embrace a world in which we relied on state and federal legislatures to do more of the rights protecting. To illustrate the point, uh, if, I had my, if, I had, if I were put to a choice, if, I were, if someone said to me, Jeff, you can only have one. You can only have Brown versus Board of Education, or you can only have the 1964 Civil Rights Act. If I could only have one of them, I would always pick the 1964 Civil Rights Act. I'd much rather live in a country where a majority of citizens think about protecting the rights of the minority, whether that minority is a racial, gender, religious, faith, whatever it might be. But that's just not the world America is right now. We still believe in judicially enforceable rights. So to me, the only realistic way to get off of this path that I think will end in tears if it continues is to continue to believe in rights protection, but diversify the ways in which we protect rights. And that's where the state courts and the state constitutions come into play. Every single individually, individual liberty or property right that we care so deeply about in this country is protected in the 50 state constitutions. And as the Pennsylvania Supreme Court Justice who spoke before me pointed out, every single one of those rights originated in state constitutions, some of them in the Pennsylvania Constitution. In fact, to put the point a little unfairly, but provocatively, the summer of 1787 and the writing of the Bill of Rights later are really just acts of plagiarism. The only patentable idea in the summer of 1787 is splitting the atom of sovereignty and creating the American notion of federalism. Everything else is a cut and paste job from the state constitutions, the state charters that were written between 1776 up to and before the summer of 1787. So, the idea of using state constitutions and state courts to protect individual rights should not be novel. They originated in the state constitutions. It should be something we we're very comfortable doing. In fact, if you'd looked at an American constitutional law treatise in the 19th century, you would have seen four-fifths of it devoted to state constitutions and state court cases. The rest, the remaining small amount, to federal cases in the federal constitutions. The Warren Court obviously had something to do with that shift, but nothing prevents us from going back and doing that. So why is it, how is it that a state court, so these guarantees that apply in both the state and federal constitutions,
Why is it that a state court might protect a right that the U.S. Supreme Court has not protected? Well, of course, I mean, if you, if you go and read the individual rights provisions in the Pennsylvania Constitution, you're going to see that most of them are not word-for-word -word imitations of the Bill of Rights or the 14th Amendment. There's a lot of variation in language. Variations in language lead to variations in history. You're going to see variations in the underlying backdrop, historical backdrop, to the writing of those guarantees. My state was not founded by Quakers. Your state was founded by Quakers. You have a free exercise case in Pennsylvania? It sure makes sense that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court would take very seriously the rights of religious dissenters. The US Supreme Court, when it has a free exercise case, it can't base its decision on the history of religious dissent in Utah, Pennsylvania, or Rhode Island. It's interpreting a guarantee for the whole country. One of the beauties of state constitutions as interpreted by state courts is they can customize their interpretations to account for unique cultural values in a state or unique cultural histories in a state. A third explanation, which follows quite naturally from the last panel, although I'm not going to use the, well, I'll, I'll stick with the terminology of the last panel, we'll say, Constitutional interpretations can be broken down into two types for the sake of argument. Originalist, fixed meaning. Living constitutionalist, non-fixed meaning. That's all there is. If you have a US Supreme Court decision that is a living constitutionalist decision, and the state Supreme Court follows an originalist approach, how is it ever the case, ever the case, that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court is going to follow that US Supreme Court decision. The only way they're going to follow that is if they're hypocrites, if they don't really believe in the originalist principles they claim to follow. Now, let me just make a point here, which um, metaphors can slay. And let me point out an inaccuracy about a metaphor that has caused a lot of problems for state constitutionalism, in my view. The metaphor out there that we're all taught in our federal con law class is that the federal constitution sets a floor and that state courts cannot go below that floor. So far, so good. That's right. That's exactly what the Supremacy Clause requires. That's only true if the state court has a federal constitutional claim. State courts are quite free to go below the federal floor in construing their own constitutional guarantees. Let me give you an example. You know, I don't know that where the Pennsylvania Supreme Court is on the question of substantive due process, but I certainly can imagine some state courts out there saying the phrase is due process. We're textualists and originalists. The phrase is a procedural guarantee. It does not have substantive content that allows a majority of our state court judges to use their policy preferences to create new constitutional rights in our state. Just because the US Supreme Court has embraced substantive due process does not require a single state court in the country to do the same with its due process guarantee. And in fact, it would be quite healthy, in my view, if more state Supreme Courts called the US Supreme Court out if they disagreed with that kind of interpretation or some other type of interpretation. What's the last reason why a state Supreme Court might take a different path from the US Supreme Court in construing identical or similarly worded guarantees? The guarantees we care the most about, the ones we fight the most about, the ones that are having such an influence at the US Supreme Court are the most general guarantees. Unreasonable search and seizure, due process, free speech, and so cruel or unusual punishment. Generalized terms don't demand a monolithic, uniform approach to interpretation. They demand quite the opposite. Proof of that is a phrase like unreasonable searches and seizures as applied to new technology and its interface with privacy. Even originalists, like Justice Thomas and Justice Scalia, disagree about how to apply the Fourth Amendment to these technology cases, with good reason. There are not a lot of you know, technology cases from the 18th century. All right, There's not a lot to go on there. 
So if even Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas, who share the same principles of interpretation, are disagreeing about Fourth Amendment cases in the modern, modern era, why in the world are state court judges not feeling the same freedom to do the same thing? Unfortunately, and I don't know if this is fair to say about the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, it's certainly fair to say about my state Supreme Court, most state Supreme Court justices start with the presumption that if the US Supreme Court has spoken on the issue, that's presumptively the right interpretation for their state constitution. That seems to me completely opposite of what it should be. In fact, the right approach is not even to pay attention to the US interpretation, to pay first of all to the history language of the state guarantee and the state precedence on that guarantee. If you happen to end up at the same place as the US Supreme Court, fine. But the idea that what the US Supreme Court is presumptively, what the US Supreme Court says is presumptively the rule for Pennsylvania is very odd to me. And it's quite odd to me that 90% of our state court judges take that approach. I mean, one of these days I'm gonna retire from being a federal judge and I just can't wait to run at for a state court judge position. It just seems so easy to do. Um, you know, to the people of Pennsylvania, do you want a methodology focused in Washington, D.C., or do you want an approach that's centered on our history, our language, our culture, and is customized to our Pennsylvania needs, whichever direction they go? Now, a couple points to end, and then I would love to take some questions. Why would this be healthy for us? And why should you embrace everything I'm about to say? In fact, I challenge you to challenge me on it. I think if I, it's very hard in modern America to find a principle that everybody agrees with, but if I could fit all Pennsylvanians in one stadium or one room or one city, I'm pretty confident I could get agreement on this one very significant political science point, that the central virtue of federalism is to use the states as policy-making labs. The reason I'm confident everybody agrees with that is it's so obvious that you don't try a new policy-making experiment on 320 million people, 51 jurisdictions at once. That's ripe for chaos, it's high risk, it just doesn't make any sense. That, of course, is the central virtue of federalism. It's the Brandeisian notion of states as laboratories of experimentation. Now, to be clear, Brandeis was referring to policy-making labs as reflected in state legislation. He was referring to state legislatures vis-a-vis -vis Congress. Use the state legislatures first, nationalize only after they've had a chance to experiment, a couple different schools of thought have emerged, the empirical data's in, and then and only then do you decide whether to nationalize it. I'm pretty confident everybody agrees with that insight. And if I've got you with that insight, you have to explain to me why the exact same insight doesn't apply to constitutional interpretation. Why shouldn't we want to take our 51 constitutions that all have the essential liberty and property guarantees in them and use our state courts as laboratories of unconstitutional interpretation before the US Supreme Court decides to nationalize this or that right? Everything about this approach would be very helpful to the problem we have right now. Number one, it would allow the US Supreme Court perhaps to be a little more patient before it referees the winner-take-all fights and declares a winner-take-all victor. In the interim, you'd have these winner-take-some fights at the state court. And if the state courts are taking their interpretive job seriously, you even create the possibility that we don't even have to nationalize all of these rights. That it's quite possible, after the state courts have been doing this for a while, the US Supreme Court can stay its hand and say, you know, wait a second, there's nothing wrong with the people of Pennsylvania taking one approach when it comes to school funding, the people of Texas taking another approach. Another way of putting all of this when it comes to constitutional rights and I, I really urge you to think about this the next time you're for a national debate, a winner-take-all debate at the US Supreme Court, is in a lot of ways we Americans are incorrigible busybodies. Why is it that we don't take 
worry a little bit more about our own neighborhood, our own city, and our own state when it becomes, comes to rights protection. That's, that seems to me the, the key way to go. The way in which we're busybodies is the people of Ohio want to tell the people of Arkansas how to live their lives. And then we in Ohio are really upset when the people of Arkansas want to return the favor and tell us how to art, live our lives. Now, it's not lost on me that there are some non-negotiable minimums in American government, whether it's no racial classifications, you know, respecting people's faith. Yes, yes, there are some uniform national requirements. That's why we have a U.S. Constitution, a U.S. Supreme Court. But we can't take every single rights dispute and have to nationalize it. There has to be some room for the people of Arkansas saying, you know, we'll leave you alone, you leave us alone. But that's not the world we're living in right now. And I, I, you know, in fact, you probably get the impression I'm blaming the US Supreme Court for the predicament we've got. That's not what I mean to say. I blame us. We're the ones that want these winner take all fights. And it's really funny. I mean, we're obviously really happy when we win. I mean, like I was really happy when we beat Penn State in football this year. <laughs> but I wasn't so happy the last time it went the other way. And um, you have to ask yourself, if you, if you love the winner, winning, don't be upset when the other team gets, they're the ones that get the win, and you're sidelined, you can't even vote on the darn issue. So that seems to me the thing we've, we've got to think a little more about. So my last point before questions is perhaps the reason this is um, so hard to sell, so hard to market, so hard to convince people it is the way we need to think about this. Whether for good or for bad, Everything I'm saying is utterly, utterly neutral. Um, I can prove that by telling you that the greatest liberal justice on the US Supreme Court, Justice Brennan, supported this in a landmark article in 1977. Everything I say in the book, he did in 15 pages. I'd like to say I did a little better, but um, if you want to save some money, he did it in 15 pages. Um, justice Scalia. I think you can make a good case the greatest conservative jurist, if not jurist period, I clerked for him the last 70 years at least, in his last majority opinion, Kansas versus Carr, said everything I'm saying. The state courts are free in the aftermath of US Supreme Court decisions or before to construe their own state constitutional guarantees however they wish. So what I'm saying can lead to decisions, um, you, know, uh, you know, some ideas that some people in this room might like. Some state courts, for example, have said, we reject Chevron. We think as a matter of state separation of powers, it doesn't make much sense to defer to an agency's interpretation of a statute. Have rejected our deference, deferring to the agency's interpretation of their own statutes. Now, there's a wonderful opinion in the Texas Supreme Court from now Judge Don Willette, it was Justice Willette, about impairment of contract and property rights. Um, some people would call it a Lochner type opinion. I don't think that's actually accurate, but it's a wonderful opinion about the Texas Constitution, and it's about you know, rejecting some licensing requirements of the Texas legislature in a pretty fair-minded way. You might call those conservative rights. Um, I'm not sure what I would call the Pennsylvania Supreme Court's redistricting decision from last spring. Um, I'm not gonna characterize it, um, but I will say this. Um, the people of, of a state are entitled to the state Supreme Court they pick or that is picked by the governor and, and affirmed by the legislature, confirmed by the legislature. And if they don't like it, they usually can find a way out of that. But the one thing I have to say about that decision, which by the way, I've not read, so I, don't, I really don't know what the Pennsylvania Constitution says about this point or exactly how they got to where they did. The one thing I will say is the stakes are a lot lower when one state does that one state Supreme Court does that. Um, the US Supreme Court had a case in front of it last year, Gill versus Whitford, an opportunity to nationalize the entire issue. So far, they have not done that. And in the interim, you have state-specific solutions. In my state, um, we had the initiative process and a referendum process being used to change the way we did redistricting. Pennsylvania and Ohio, both purple states, both obviously taking this issue fairly seriously and coming to different ways of dealing with it. And maybe in a federalist system, that's not all bad. So um, I could go on and on about this and get more and more enthusiastic about it, but perhaps 
it's about time for me to um, take some hard questions from you, um, or even easy questions from you, uh, challenging me or offering um, your own perspectives on this. Um, but once again, I want to say I'm really thrilled to be here. I love this state, and uh, you know, my wife's from Ohio, so that's why I'm in Ohio. But uh, good for you for being Pennsylvanians. So, um, so what do you have to say? <laughs> Just raise your hand and speak up. Yeah. Let's just stop there. I, I don't want to. This usually usually these things lead to a but. But let's just establish the ground rules. We're all in agreement, and I uh, get a phone call. Right? Yeah. Excellent. Um, with the states being lab individual laboratories, of democracy, even to the extent that that relates to the courts. So that's all well and good. And each state having its own constitutional constitution allows for uh, differences as well. But the underpinnings to all of that were that when the states were founded, they really did have different personalities. You might have a state that was founded by Quakers, a state that was founded by Methodists, a state that was agricultural, a state that was not. So you really, uh, had, you really had distinctive personalities within the states. I don't think that's so much so anymore. So what does that do to your thesis? Well, I mean, I'm disappointed in a Pennsylvania say, saying that, so I'll have to use a different state to illustrate my point. Uh, you come to Columbus, you could be my guest at the Ohio State-Michigan game, and you tell me that there is no difference between Ohio and Michigan. Uh, there'll be 110,000 insane people in that game, and if there's one thing they agree on, is that we are different. Uh, well, so, no, so that's I'll a glib, you, let, that's let me, glib, uh, that's a glib point. I can retort to that, so I went to the Penn State-Ohio State game, two weekends ago, and the only people who embarrassed themselves of the 110,000 were the Ohioans. Yeah, well, I, I, must, I, must, I must say, I, I'm not sure I can even defend them on this. Uh, and, you know, hey, listen, I grew up in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, but New Jersey mainly, and I couldn't, I didn't even understand college football until I got there, and I just thought, what is wrong with these people? I mean, who could take this so seriously? But now I'm one of them, so... Uh, you probably saw me. I, I wasn't at the game, but I would have been behaving just as badly. So a little more seriously, um, there is a point to the idea that when the states were founded, um, there were greater differences. And of course there would be greater differences because it was harder to travel. And increased tr travel leads to people relocating more. And it, it, is, it is fair to say that maybe the, um, the fact that this state was quite homogenous, this state was quite homogenous, but they were both quite different, is, is less and less true. I, I really quite accept the point. In fact, to make the point I'm about to make, let me just assume, quite counter to the facts, that all Americans are one race, they're one gender, they're one faith, they're all everything. It's still 320 million of them, still facing incredibly difficult policy problems. And the Brandeis insight did not turn on whether a state was more filled with people of faith versus not, or more Western or a different accent. That was not what it turned on. His insight turned on our size. And that is, the re you know, that is our problem. This is a very big country with a lot of different perspectives of how we ought to handle things. And we ought to embrace that. And I think at the same time, be a little more tolerant of respecting differences, um, ideally forever. But if we can't, or we really think there's a non-negotiable uniform baseline required, at least take the time before we do the winner-take-all fight. Because when you do the winner-take-all fights prematurely, it leads a, to a lot of resentment to the losing side. And that's not great. And the longer Congress or the US Supreme Court waits to nationalize something, the fewer losers there are. And the fewer losers, the less resentment. Ideally, the better the body politics. So it's a, you're quite right that things have changed, and we do have a lot more in common uh, than we once did. Um, but I, I'll tell you, I've been speaking all over the country uh, the last six months. It's, there are a lot of very different places to live in this country. There really are. Um, and as someone who grew up on the East Coast and now lives in the Midwest, and by the way, forgive me, I'm quite contemptuous at this point of the East Coast. I love the Midwest. I would never leave the Midwest. Um, and if you, and if you're not from Pittsburgh and you're not happy in Philadelphia, come to Columbus. Uh, it is a great place to live. Uh, there are fewer people, we're not as stressed out, and we really are pretty nice, except 
on football Saturdays. <laughs> but that's a good point. So no, other questions? Um, I disagree. I think Pennsylvania and California are identical. But uh, <laughs> I just wanted to ask, as you've been touring around trying to promote these ideas, have you seen evidence of success in gaining traction? Do you have hope for the future that, that this uh, sort of perspective will take hold and, and, and be successful? Yeah. Um, well, I, uh, to quote uh, someone who might come to mind, I wake up on the sun, with the sunrise side of the mountain. I, I like that. I'd not heard that phrase before. And it describes me as well. Um, you, let me put it this way. I've not given a talk where when I was done with the talk, I said, oh, darn, I didn't think of that. Or, oh, darn, that's a really good point that really explains why um, this isn't working as well as I'd like. Um, I actually think quite the opposite. Um, so, you know, we were in, a, we're in a, an era where more, con more conservative types, or we'll just generalize quite unfairly, fed sock types, always pay attention to federalism, right? I mean, the whole question, I think David pointed out, the most important question in con law is who decides. That is the most important question to the federal society's credit. They, they sponsor one talk, one seminar, one national convention after another about one question, who decides? Not what the decision is, who decides? And we Americans are too obsessed with what the decision is and not who decides. So federal society types are inclined towards this. Progressives are notice, noticing it's not great to rely entirely on the national government all the time, um, whether it's the presidency, Congress, or the court. And so it's, it's a good time there. Um, I think one challenge one faces is the law schools still do not teach state constitutional law. So that's why the language of federal constitutional law dominates things so much. Um, you know, I'd like to pick up on the conversation uh, earlier about equal protection. I mean. How funny it is that the state courts adopt the tiers of review from the federal model. Um, we federal judges, in my view, have failed on that front. I mean, Professor Tribe says there are now seven tiers of review. I mean, if there's seven, there will be eight. And after there are eight, there will be nine. And at some point, I would have thought it was before seven, you have to start asking yourself, are these principled, useful distinctions? And yet, even the state court judges continue to follow the tiers of review. I, I would really urge them to say, that was a failed experiment. We're going to try something else. And by the way, if you go back in history, the state courts under their state constitutions had something called class legislation in the 19th, early 20th century as a way to deal with differential treatment of like-situated people. It wasn't a bad way to go. And it might be something worth reinventing under state constitutions. Yeah, in the back there, and then. Uh, before I ask my question, I'd just like to make a comment, because you asked us to comment on your presentation. Um, I haven't read your book yet. You might have covered this in the book, but you turned a light bulb on in my head when you mentioned how you felt that we should use things at the state level to get a consensus to bring things on board before we nationalize it. And I realized you were talking about the judicial branch. That's exactly how we do it with the legislative branch with the amendment process. So if we've got separate branches with equal powers, we should use somewhat similar procedures. So that makes a lot of sense to get us a, a state consensus with a vast majority like we do there. Yes. So thank you for helping me see that. My question is, in your research, you've obviously studied a lot of state constitutions. We're sort of on the bias side here because we live in Pennsylvania. We always hear how great Pennsylvania state constitution is. Is there any particular state constitution in your research that has stood out as uh, a real model or amazing compared to the others? And if so, which? Yeah, well, so the Pennsylvania one is terrific. Um, particularly its roots. Uh, I mean, that's the, um, the unfortunate, well, let me, let me, both the 50 state constitutions and the US Constitution both have a defect. Um, the US Constitution, in my view, is too difficult to amend. It requires three quarters of the states. That means it's basically not amendable with a, con a controversial issue. And in my opinion, the state constitutions are too easy to amend. Uh, most of them can be amended with a 51% vote. Sometimes you can do it with a direct initiative. Sometimes it's proposed by the legislature. If I had my way, I would have the US Constitution be a little easier to amend, maybe 2 thirds, and the state constitution's a little harder in the 55% 60 range. I mention this because that is the, um, the unfortunate reality of many state constitutions, including the Ohio Constitution. The US Constitution's in the five, 6,000 word territory. 
My constitution is about 59,000 words. We've got an amendment that'll take it to 69,000 words. When you read these things, when you read the individual rights guarantees, they look terrific. When you read the initial structure of government stuff, terrific. Again, they became the models of the US Constitution, the Bill of Rights. Then you start going on and you start saying, wow, this looks like a yard sale waiting to happen. Um, a lot of things that were bought that never should have been bought and we need to get rid of them. Um, and so there, I, there's only, I, I can only think of three states that have constitutions that really look like the U.S. Constitution, and I, I much prefer the sparing language. Um, I, you know, if you constitutionalize everything, you ultimately constitutionalize nothing, and you really diminish what it means to constitutionalize something. So my state, and I'm afraid Pennsylvania, falls a little bit in this camp, um, maybe constitutionalizing a few too many things and use, use you know, legislation to handle most policy debates. There's a question here. Yes. Uh, yeah, no, so uh, uh, th that's a really um, nice point. So let's just put it in context. So let's go back to our key property rights and individual rights, liberty rights. Those are in both, all right? So it's, it's really quite similar. It's either word for word quite similar or the concepts are both there. But after that, there is a lot more. Now let me give you a rights thing that um, I, I think Pennsylvania has at least two of, to my knowledge. Um, so when you think of rights in the U.S. Constitution, you think negative. You think um, Old Testament, thou shalt not, um, right? It's a bunch of thou shalt nots, negative. You cannot do this. State constitutions, by contrast, have some positive rights. So some state constitutions say to the legislature, for example, you have a duty to do this. So I think your Pennsylvania Constitution has something about education, I think I heard earlier. The Ohio one does as well. That's a mandate to the legislature to create, in, my, in the words of my Constitution, a thorough and efficient system of public schools. Those guarantees, positive requirements, appear in almost every state constitution. About a third of the constitutions have what you have, this, another positive right, the legislature's responsibility to look after the environment. That too, a positive right. So that is a very good example of differentiation that appears in the state constitution. And whether we Americans are fairly alike or much more alike than we used to be 200 years ago, if you examined our state constitutions, it's a really nice point that you would see an awful lot of very serious differences as, what we, as to what we choose to prioritize in those fundamental charters. I mean, that's the fundamental charter of a state. And if they're different, and they feature and prioritize different things, that does say something about the values of that particular state. Yeah, so I, I didn't, um, yeah, so uh, the, the questioner wondered if in the course of doing the book, I. Um, had a chance to look at the anti-federalist essays and particularly, um, I think it's Brutus's statements about the federal judiciary and his warnings about the federal judiciary. I think it's a he, I don't know. I don't think we actually know for sure who the person was. It could have been a she. Maybe Abigail Adams was out there on the other side of all this. Uh, she's a pretty good writer. Um, so the answer is no. I kind of want to say yes, so you'll buy the book. Uh, but uh, but I, I, I think it's going to be a close call either way. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to do a false advertising. So there's nothing about Brutus in there. Um, but I, I want to emphasize this point, because it's just a great point. And I assume this is why you're asking the question. Um, you know, the Federalist Anti-Federalist debate is, is obviously wonderful. And it's number 78 Hamilton's is what we hear about the judiciary, forecast there'll be judicial review. But boy, do the Anti-Federalist papers lay out the risks of creating this federal judiciary. Um, you know, it was called the least dangerous branch. Um, you know, it was not a super engaged branch for a hundred years, did create, start a civil war, but other than that, they didn't do an awful lot. Um, 
you know, it's quite an other than that statement. Um, but Brutus has proved right um, that the court would take general, his key word is they'll take equitable principles in general terms and use interpretation to expand their power. Um, you know, let, me, let me test out a, a theory I have on you. Maybe someone here can help me with this. Um, I love the Roberts. You know, there's a lot of people that have criticized the balls and strikes metaphor. Um, I'm not one of them. I actually think when you're in a confirmation hearing, you've got to speak in a way that people understand and not talk too technically. And I think balls and strikes is not a bad way to think about it. And of course, it, it's about our American pastime, which doesn't hurt either, hurt either. I'm sure that's why Justice Kavanaugh invoked it. So I think the criticism that goes in for that I don't care for, which is, oh, you know, there is no such thing as balls and strikes. We've watched games and certain umpires call a little bigger, the strikes are a little bigger, some a little narrower. My answer to all that is fine. Judges can be, they can have small strike zones, they can have bigger, bigger strike zones, nothing wrong with that at all. Here's, here's the part of the metaphor that um, gives me pause and I'm still working through in my head. The reason I don't think it's, a gr it's perfectly accurate is what it suggests is there are just two players in the debate. Uh, you know, there's the pitcher and the batter, and it's binary. One wins, one loses. The one thing about judging, and most importantly, interpreting the federal constitution, is when you're the umpire, you become the third player every time you call something within the constitutional strike zone. In other words, the minute they constitutionalize something, they're no longer a neutral, not involved, they're now a player. Because the minute they constitutionalize it, they're playing in the next game. Because once you constitutionalize something, you'll have a next case. And the next case will ask, well, how exactly does this constitutional principle work in this new area? So the reason the balls and strikes, it's a great metaphor. But the, the complication it has, and the thing I think federal judges in particular don't think enough about, is once you call it a strike, we'll call a strike constitutionalizing, you just became a player. You're no longer just a referee. And to say you're just a referee is not really accurate. I mean, think of it this way. You've got your, the, the game is between Congress and the president. One of them sues the other and says the Constitution speaks to something. If the US Supreme Court says, no, it doesn't, this will be worked out in the political process through Congress and the president negotiating, and they'll just use the principles of politics to sort this out. When the court says that, they are not a player. When the court says the Constitution does speak to it, and we're going to tell you where the line is, they just became a player. And so that's the, that's the, that's the downside of what is a wonderful metaphor. Um, and I'm still trying to work through my head exactly how this should work, but I, I sometimes think that we federal judges don't pay attention to that quite enough. Yes? You sound like a resentful catcher, um, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to bet I'm going to bet you were a catcher that took a, a ball outside the strike zone and tried to sneak it in there. And so, why, why should a judge or a referee or umpire listen to you on this stuff? I don't know, but I, I get the I take the point. Um, I think the point does work best with a purely legal question: What does the Constitution mean? You know, just we're asked, what does it mean? Does does it cover um, monetary contributions? Does the free speech clause cover that? That's not, that really is in fact. That's an interpretation, and that's where principles of textualism and originalism are so important because they do decrease the risk that you become a player, and they increase the risk that you're performing the task that lawyers perform, which is the only thing that justifies judicial review, in my view. It's, it's a lawyerly task, and then therefore a bunch of lawyers can do it well.
Once it goes beyond being a lawyerly task and about policy, it's not just that we can't do it well, I think we do it horrendously. Um, and we shouldn't be asked to do it. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. The student. The student. Yeah, no, thank, that's such a great question, thank you. Um, so I, I think this is a practitioner and um, court point. So if I were running a state court, I would actually have rules that say you don't have to bring a challenge to a state and local law under the state and federal constitution, but if you choose to do it, they must be briefed separately and you always must brief the state claim first. Um, this, that practice, whether it's required by state court rules or it's done by state practitioners will be hugely helpful in increasing the independence of state constitutionalism. The way it should be briefed is you, you, you identify your state claim, you brief it, and then you say quite wisely, um, strategically as well, at the end of that section, if the court invalidates the state or local law on this Pennsylvania guarantee, it, there is no reason to go on. There's no reason to address the federal claim. You can end it there. Most Judges, I can assure you, prefer deciding less rather than more. And indeed, if they do that, the case is over at the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. The US Supreme Court has no jurisdiction, no power to review a Pennsylvania Supreme Court decision about the Pennsylvania Constitution. Unless that constitutional decision somehow separately, separately violates a federal guarantee, which is quite unusual. So that's, that's really a, a really healthy way to think about it, and let me just say one other thing about this. Um, I've probably read about 500 state Supreme Court decisions where the state court does more than the US Supreme Court required. What's the common denominator there? Well, obviously, as your Commonwealth versus Edmonds decision points out, if there's a textual difference, that, that, that obviously is all you might need. But what, digging below that, what's going on? Well, this is the thing where in my view, it doesn't matter whether the state court justice is Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, originalist, living constitutionalist. It's finding something that the people of the state, Pennsylvanians, take seriously and are proud of. So if there's one thing I know you take seriously, it's history, because Pennsylvania's history was America's history. So there is not, I doubt there's a state Supreme Court justice in the state that ever lived that would not have been tremendously excited about a brief that identified an historical nugget anecdote that bore on that case. In fact, the odds are really high they're gonna overstate its relevance because they're so excited about finding this. And so the really good litigants uh, are the ones that they, they find it in the history, they find it in the precedents. Maybe it's just something about what people of Pennsylvania take pride in. Um, and that's, that's what captures the legal imagination of state court judges, whether elected or not, I don't care, blue, red, whatever. And it'll, it'll work every time. Um, you know, the other, there were some suggestions, where does one go for this stuff? Well, your history is really rich. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think it's really as hard for you as it is for some of the Western states to have a lot of history here on the constitutions and so, I think you're really fortunate. I think there's an awful lot to work with. And uh, all, it's, what, what just blows me away is how often people choose not even to pay attention to the state guarantee. I mean, that, that's really quite an oddity to me. But a great question. Yeah, in the back. So uh, earlier you were saying that you think that it's an unfortunate trend that state Supreme Courts don't interpret their state constitutions to go below the federal minimum when it comes to in individual rights. I, I'm just wondering what the, what the practical value of reversing that trend would be if it's the case that any litigant can always choose to rely on the greater federal right. Yeah, it's really, I'm, I'm so glad you asked the question and I, I'm gonna guess you're speaking for a few other people um, given the number of times I've discussed this in other audiences, so, so thank you. Um, so let me dignify uh, the question and ex explain why the questioner is quite right in one sense. Um, 
It's true. If the federal constitution already applies, so let's go back to my substantive due process, um, procedural due process dichotomy. So um, you have a state, hypothetically, that has not gone down the road of substantive due process and construing their due process guarantee. But we know, of course, the US Supreme Court has gone down that road. So hypothetically, you have a state or local law. It's clearly invalid under the federal substantive due process interpretation. What the questioner is saying is, I, I'm going to put words in his mouth. Um, Gee, Jeff, I think you might be right. It might be healthy to have this debate, and it might be healthy for state courts to disagree with the US Supreme Court. But it just doesn't seem very practical if the state or local law is still going to fall. All right, This is, I think, the point he's making. And by the way, what client is going to pay for that? I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's really weird. I mean, we have to pay attention to that, or you have to pay attention to that as lawyers. I life tenure job. I don't have to worry about getting, getting clients. Um, but let me, let me try to illustrate this with a, um, um, an example that I think pr confirms the point. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a, progress a progressive side example. But it, it deals with a really prominent debate and dispute. Um, so Citizens United would probably be the US Supreme Court decision, at least over the last couple decades, that liberals and progressives would most like to overrule. Uh, that's my guess. So I'm just trying to make the point, high stakes case. I think it comes out in 2010. The next year, there was a challenge to a Montana corporate, um, Montana law that limited corporations in funding political parties or making contributions to candidates. And the law was clearly covered by Citizens United. Um, per the questioner's point, the Montana Supreme Court could have dealt with that case in one sentence. And you know, it's over, sorry. Um, Montana, it turns out, has a really interesting his history when it comes to um, corporate capture of legislatures. I mean, that's a really serious point in Montana. It's a really interesting um, state politically. On this, it's not interesting at all. They speak as one on this point. The Copper Barons left a really unfortunate legacy um, and literally disfigured the one thing Montana has, rivers and mountains, um, with these copper plants. And the legislature, the governors couldn't do anything to stop it because they were in the pockets of the copper barons. So knowing full well this history, what did the Montana Supreme Court do? Well, the Montana Supreme Court was just so outraged by Citizens United, so outraged by having to apply it in dear Montana. They write this decision that basically says, well, whatever Citizens United means, it can't possibly apply in Montana. I mean, it's almost as if they thought they were France. You know, well, it just doesn't apply here, uh, foreign law and all that stuff. Um, well, unfortunately, the Supremacy Clause speaks directly to this. I mean, the Supremacy Clause mentions state judges by name as having to follow federal constitutional decisions. So they were quite understandably reverse 9-0. What should they have done? So as I pointed out earlier, the right sequence in a dual claim case, a state and federal case, really I would say any federal case, is to first ask what does the state guarantee mean? So as long as a state court has that practice, um, which they really should have, right? I mean, why would you resolve the claim of the bigger sovereign, the United States, before the claim by the smaller sovereign, the state, the state constitutional guarantee? So what the Montana Supreme Court should have done, and but for this metaphor that slays, the idea you can't go below the federal floor, what they should have done is said, there are two free speech guarantees that regulate or limit state and local laws in the state of Montana. There's the First Amendment, and then there's the Montana guarantee. And what they should have done is started with the state guarantee, done everything they did in the regular opinion, and then just said, in Montana, free speech covers speech, not money, right? I mean, that would have been the slogan. That's the way they would have put it. They're allowed to say that. Had they done that in 2011, I suspect by 2018, you'd have had some other state courts adopting a similar interpretation. So you're quite right from a dollars and cents practical point, a law that's invalid under the federal constitution is still invalid under the federal constitution as long, here's the key point, as long as that US Supreme Court decision is still good law. But in a Brandeis world where we treat the states as 51 labs of interpretation, it should go both directions. It's not a ratchet, it can just keep going up. State courts can disagree and say we protect more, but they should feel very comfortable saying, what were you thinking? It protects less.
And that's a neutral principle. I'm not telling you which rights to protect more or which to protect less. What I am saying is a state Supreme Court should take very seriously its independent sovereign duty to figure out what that charter of government means. And it is so strange to me. I mean, it almost, if there was a state equivalent of treason, this would be it. The idea that they're not going to intend independently construe whether it goes up or down, that, that just doesn't make sense to me. So it's a great question. Thank you for asking it. And you're right about the practical point. But I, I do think there's, there's the Brandeis side of it. And I, I actually think that would be very healthy. I mean, I think the whole point of my Buck versus Bell story is what a 60,000 people involuntarily sterilized in this country. More than half of them after 1927, because the great Oliver Wendell Holmes in an 8-1 decision of the US Supreme Court says you can do it and even suggests eugenics is a good idea. And that's in a world where a lot of state courts had said no. But after the Supreme Court said yes, no one went back to state court. No one used their state constitutions. It was as if we can't even attack that because there's this Delphic oracle. They're not. You know, he was a great justice, but he makes mistakes. We all make quite a few mistakes. And a great way to identify those mistakes is not be afraid to construe state constitutions differently from the US Supreme Court when that's appropriate or justified by language or history. So I have to catch a flight, but I just, you guys are such a smart audience. Um, I don't, I'm not gonna say I want Penn State to win next year, but I, uh, I, I will smile if they do, all right? I will smile if they do.